Can I already start? Ah, there I see it, okay. So hi everybody, welcome to the NISC consensus and delay function session. I'm Alon Rosen, I'm chairing the session together with Giulio Manavolta, you can see him also appearing here. Okay. Uh, our first talk amongst the, the five talks that we have in the session uh, is titled Spartan, efficient and general purpose zero knowledge snarks without the trusted setup. And the speaker is uh, Srinath Sethi. He will have five minutes to speak and then we'll have five minutes for discussion while we set up uh, for the next talk. So uh, you, can, you can begin soon enough, thank you. Thank you. This talk is about a new family of ZK snarks, which we call Spartan. Before I describe Spartan, let's recall what a ZK snark is. A ZK snark is an argument of knowledge, meaning that it's a protocol between a prover and a verifier. Specifically, given a circuit C, the prover wants to prove the knowledge of a witness W such that the circuit is satisfiable. Second, it's a zero knowledge argument, meaning that the proof hides the witness. Third, it's non-interactive. Finally, it's succinct. Uh, there are two forms of succinctness. First, the size of the proof is sublinear in the size of the circuit. Second, the cost to verify the proof is also sublinear in the size of the circuit. There are many approaches to build ZK snarks in the literature, starting with the works of Killian and Michali. Unfortunately, they rely on PCP, so they remain too expensive to be used in practice. A breakthrough result in this area was provided by the work of GGPR. Their scheme supports proving the satisfiability of arbitrary circuits. More importantly, the scheme achieves near optimal asymptotics with good constants. Unfortunately, a major downside with this scheme is that it requires a per circuit trusted setup. The setup is trusted because it requires a trapdoor that must be kept secret. This problem has motivated another class of works called ZK snarks without trusted setup. There are several schemes in this class. Unfortunately, existing schemes can support either arbitrary circuits or a succinct verifier, but not both. For example, Hyrax supports a succinct verifier, but it requires its circuits to be layered data parallel circuits. Similarly, Stark supports a succinct verifier, but it requires circuits to be a sequence of repeated subcircuits. On the other side, we have Ligero, Aurora, and Bulletproofs that target arbitrary circuits, but they, require, but they incur linear time verification costs. In contrast, our work can simultaneously support arbitrary circuits and a succinct verifier. This turns out to be challenging because arbitrary circuits by definition have no structure. Furthermore, the verifier must actually know what statement it's verifying. What this means is that verification must be at least linear in the size of the circuit. Spartan gets around this problem by pre-processing circuits, but without using any secret trapdoors. In particular, the verifier retains a short cryptographic commitment to the description of the circuit, which we call a computation commitment. Creating a computation commitment requires time that's at least linear in the size of the circuit, but it's reusable. Uh, in the next one minute or so, I'm going to provide an overview of how Spartan works. So the foundation of Spartan is the sum check protocol, which is an interactive proof system for proving that a polynomial sums to a target value T over some Boolean hypercube. But Spartan is interested in proving the satisfiability of circuits. So in the paper, we provide a reduction from R1CS instances to sum check instances, where R1CS generalizes arithmetic circuit satisfiability. We then design a set of techniques in conjunction with existing compilers to transform the sum check protocol into a non-interactive zero knowledge proof system for R1CS. Here, both the prover and the verifier take as input some public parameters and the description of the circuit, which is denoted by this tuple ABC. Uh, but because the verifier reached the description of the circuit, the cost of the verifier is at least linear in the circuit size. So we design another algorithm that we call an encoder that treats the description of the circuit and outputs a computation commitment, which consists of commitments to three polynomials that describe the circuit. So we combine this computation commitment with our NISIC proof system to get a ZK snark, where instead of reading the, uh, the description of the circuit, the verifier reads a computation commitment. The prover, in addition to producing a NISIC proof of satisfiability, it also produces a proof of correct evaluation of the computation commitment which we denote with pi gamma. 
One remaining technical problem is that both the encoder and the prover require a polynomial commitment scheme for sparse multilinear polynomials. So we, if we apply existing schemes, the, both the encoder and the prover incur costs that are quadratic in the size of the circuit. So we design a generic compiler that can take an existing polynomial commitment scheme for dense multilinear polynomials and then transform it into a scheme for sparse multilinear polynomials. We implemented the scheme and here's a table that depicts the performance of Spartan and compares it with existing schemes. There are three takeaways here. First, Spartan offers the fastest prover. Second, Growth 16, which requires a trusted setup, offers the fastest verifier and shortest proof sizes. But if we focus on schemes that do not require a trusted setup, Spartan offers uh, the fastest verifier and shortest proof sizes. The only exception here is the size of the proof under bullet proofs, but bullet proofs incur slower verification, both asymptotically and concretely. With that, I can take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Julio is taking over with the question. Yes, thanks for the talk. Uh, if you have questions, please make yourself noticed. Uh, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question. So I have a quick question for you. Um, uh, you, you show this table. Under which uh, uh, assumptions do, uh, does your um, does your scheme uh, provide those guarantees? Uh, so the implemented scheme uh, requires um, the hardness of discrete logarithms in the random oracle model. But uh, uh, so the assumptions made by Spartan are essentially the assumptions required for the polynomial commitment scheme. So the one we implement requires uh, the hardness of discrete logarithms. I see, but it's not difficult to, to implement it using other uh, yes. constructions, possibly from other assumptions. Yes. Got it. I have another question. Uh, actually, two questions. The first one is about the times of the implementation that you reported. Uh, looking at the table, they seem fantastically faster than other uh, solutions. Do you have an explanation to that? Oh, so, so, sorry, could you repeat the question? So, so the times that you reported for your proofs for Spartan seems the uh, orders of magnitude fa faster than yes. all of the other proofs. Yes. Do you yes. have an explanation? How could this be possibly true? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Spartan relies on the sum check protocol, which is uh, uh, a lot of the work happens with uh, scalar arithmetic rather than cryptographic work. So. Uh, the amount of cryptographic work that uh, Spartan needs is much less than many of the existing schemes. So, so it can... For, for instance, uh, Starks, that rely, they rely on PCPs, but they do rely on symmetric key crypto. Yes, yes, and yes. Cryptography is not so expensive, and it seems like the reported numbers there are much bigger. Yes, yes. So uh, for compared to Starks, so one, one um, difficulty with Starks is even though the, uh, the most primitive operation is very efficient, uh, it needs to do a lot more of those operations. So overall, and, and it also requires the repetitions to boost the soundness error. Uh, so if you count the end-to-end -end cost, it turns out it, it requires more work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Tamer, you're the next speaker. Uh, do you want to share the screen? Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Um, yes. So let's wait a half a minute so that we are in mm -hmm. on time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to. Okay, so our, our next uh, our next uh, talk is titled NIST from LPN and Raptor Hash via correlation intractability for approximable relation. It's a paper by Zvika Bargeski, Venkata Coppola, and Tamer Mu, and Tamer will give the talk. 
thanks, Alon. Cool. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about our paper where we construct a non-interactive zero knowledge protocol uh, based on trapdoor hash and LPM. And since we know how to get a trapdoor hash based on the DDH assumption, then uh, 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 one of the consequences is the first NISIC under uh, uh, both LPN and DDH uh, combined. Uh, so this is a joint work with Sfika and Venkata. So let's first recall what uh, non-interactive zero knowledge uh, for an NP language L. Uh, it's simply a zero knowledge uh, proof system, which is non-interactive. So it has only one message. And we know that we can get NISICs for NP only in the CRS model. So we're going to assume the existence of a CRS. Um, so uh, NISICs are very powerful. They have lots of uh, nice applications in crypto, uh, but they are uh, known to be constructed only under a uh, limited set of standard assumptions uh, that include in particular LWE uh, pairing and uh, factoring related uh, assumptions. And like I said, uh, in our paper, we show the first NISIC under uh, both LPN and DDH. So uh, the way we get NISX is through the uh, general paradigm of uh, the Fiat Chamin transform. So we start with a three message a public coin zero knowledge protocol, which is interactive. And we use a hash function uh, to remove the interaction uh, from that protocol. Uh, so more specifically, instead of letting the verifier uh, sample and send uh, uh, his challenge, uh, we let the prover compute the verifier's challenge uh, using the hash function. So the verifies challenge in the non-interactive protocol is simply the hash function applied on the prover's first message uh, using a hash key that we sample uh, in the CRS. Um, so we know that the Fiat Chamir transform preserves both completeness and zero knowledge, but it's not clear that we get a sound protocol even if we start with a sound-based protocol. Uh, and the way we usually claim soundness of uh, Fiat Chamir is by saying that it's computationally hard for a cheating prover to find a first uh, message A such that H of A, which is essentially the verifies challenge, uh, is a bad challenge. And, and by, by, by that, I mean a challenge that may possibly allow a cheating prover uh, to cheat. So it's bad for the verifier. And more generally, we can consider the notion which is called correlation interactability. So a correlation interactable hash H uh, is a, a hash family where it's hard to find an input A such that A and H of A satisfy some general relation. So the relation we're going to consider here for NISX is the bad challenge relation that relates any first message with the set of bad challenges. Cool. So in order to uh, draw the uh, outline of our contribution, I'm actually going to start with period work. So in last crypto, uh, PyCard and Shehan uh, show how to take uh, uh, a, crypto a cryptographic primitive uh, that enjoys uh, some homomorphism for a function class F and construct correlation tractability for all relations that are searchable by the function class F. And by that, I mean that if we take any uh, function uh, in the class, small f, uh, then it's hard to find an input x such that h of x and f of x are equal. Um, and they use the observation that uh, the bad challenge function for some zero knowledge protocol is unique and is efficiently computable. And this allows us to focus on the function class of uh, efficiently computable functions. So we know that we can, uh, so yeah, so in, uh, in this picture, uh, this f of x is our bad challenge. Uh, so uh, 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 using this observation, we know that uh, we get homomorphism uh, for all efficiently computable functions under uh, LWE. So this is simply a full, um, a full homomorphism. Uh, and therefore we get correlation interactability for all efficiently computable relations, in particular, our bad challenge function. And therefore we get NISX under LWE. So uh, what we do differently is we observe that if we start with uh, homomorphic primitives that further enjoy some very nice uh, and useful structure, uh, then we can get a stronger correlation to activity guarantees. Uh, so uh, in particular, we, uh, we get a hash family where it's hard for an, for an adversary to find a, an X such that H of X and F of X are even close to each other uh, in Hamming distance. So, uh, this allows us to consider the approximation complexity of uh, our target function, the bad uh, challenge function. Um, and we observe that there exists some zero knowledge protocol based on LPN, where the bad challenge function can be probabilistically computable uh, using constant degree polynomials. Uh, and uh, uh, to formalize uh, this a bit, then uh, we show that uh, with probability all but negligible, uh, uh, our bad challenge function falls inside the Hamming ball of an evaluation of a constant degree polynomial over x. Uh, so we sample a constant degree polynomial from some distribution and with overwhelming probability, uh, our batch challenge uh, is inside this Hamming ball. Um, and this means that uh, correlation uh, interactability against uh, uh, relations approximable by a constant degree polynomials is sufficient for music. 
uh, and we show that uh, um, our uh, well-structured homomorphism requirement is satisfied by an, by an abstraction called trapdoor hash, which can be instantiated under DDH. And therefore, combining LPN and DDH, uh, we get uh, NISX uh, following this uh, outcome. So uh, let me conclude uh, uh, with a, a real quick discussion. So we introduced this new notion of uh, correlation interactability for approximate relations. Uh, so it basically says that it's uh, hard for an adversary to find uh, an input X such that H of X and some function in our target class uh, 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 F, uh, so uh, that H of X and F of X are uh, close to each other. And uh, like I said, this allows us to consider uh, the approximation complexity of uh, our target class, which is usually weaker than the exact complexity. Uh, uh, and uh, following this, we get uh, NISX under uh, uh, new standard assumptions. But it's very natural to ask whether there are more applications of this notion. And one reason to believe that uh, there's some potential there is because this uh, notion of correlation interactability, it relates between an input X and a set of uh, outputs, which is in, in this case, uh, the Hamming ball around some uh, F of X, rather than an input X with and a unique output, uh, uh, similarly to the uh, uh, very recent works that uh, got NISX under standard assumptions. Uh, cool, uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you very much, Tamer. Okay, thank, thanks Tamer for the talk. I actually have a few questions for you, but I'm going to let the audience ask if they have any. By the way, if you have questions that you want to ask later, it's also possible. So. Yes, you can either go on the Zulip chat or, or write them here on Zoom. Um, okay, so so maybe let, let, let me let me start. Um, you mentioned LPN. What's the what's the noise regime uh, that 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 you need in order to instantiate? So we need the low noise. We need uh, something around one over square root uh, dimension of the. I see. So yeah, constant, constant is not enough. Okay, so Julio, are there any other questions? Okay, so we can move uh, to the next uh, talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tamer. Uh, Dominic, can you share the screen? Okay, so the next talk is titled Shorted Non Interactive Zero Knowledge Arguments and ZAPs for Algebraic Languages by Jeffrey Akuto and Dominic Hartman. And uh, Dominic uh, will give the talk. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I'll t um, as the title said, um, I'll talk about non interactive zero knowledge arguments. And um, so We've seen the setup before, but let me briefly recap it. We have Alice who wants to convince Bob of some statement, but um, Alice does not want to reveal her secret witness, so we want zero knowledge proofs. And there are two broad types, uh, interactive protocols uh, like Sigma protocols, as we've seen in the talk before, where Alice and Bob um, exchange multiple messages. And these protocols are often really simple and well understood, but have the disadvantage that uh, both parties have to wait for the other person's messages and they are also non-transferable. So in many cases we require non-interactive zero knowledge where Alice can simply send a single message um, but then we require additional setup like a common reference string or the random oracle model um, and additionally they are often computationally more expensive than interactive proofs so there's a bit of a um, balance between, between the two. So um, we introduce a new way to build uh, NISX, uh, but let me first recap some existing constructions and why we need another one. So we've seen in, in the last talk um, the fiat Tremier transformation, which takes an interactive protocol and compiles it into a NISX using uh, the random oracle model. And this yields very efficient proofs for uh, many languages. And um, if we assume the random oracle, we can reduce everything to the security of the underlying SIPCAP protocol. But the random oracle is a huge drawback because real hash functions simply aren't random oracles. So we would like to avoid them if we can. Another um, method for constructing NISX is the gross high methodology, which uses pairings and can prove statements over pairing product equations under standard assumptions in the standard model. 
but is way less efficient than, um, than future mere proofs. Um, and a third line of work is uh, so-called quasi-adaptive NISICs, which um, are also possible in the standard model under standard assumptions, but only for the class of linear languages, which is um, a lot smaller than pairing product equations or even uh, NP. So the question is, can we find um, a proof system which is um, as easy and, and efficient as the future mere transformation, but secure in the standard model under some standard assumption and has uh, full adaptive soundness and not only quasi-adaptive. And um, in this paper, we present a new compiler uh, for Sigma protocols to NISIX, which does not require random oracles in the security proof and works for algebraic languages. The efficiency is almost as good as the fiat mir transformation, and it is um, also fully adaptively sound, but has the downside that we require a new assumption which we call the extended kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption, which as the name suggests is an extension of the uh, kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. So how does our construction look? It's actually pretty simple. We start from a Sigma protocol, so a three move public coin interactive protocol, and we want to remove the interaction. So the message E from the verifier, um, and we can't use hash functions since then we would likely need random oracles again. So we want to give it as the common reference string, but we can't give it in the clear. So instead we hide it in the exponent of a group, but not the same as the language, but in a second group. So we move to a pairing group setting with asymmetric pairings between G1 and G2 and hide E in the exponent of the second group while the language still remains in the first group. Now, of course, the second flow of the prover has to move to group G2 as well, but similarly to the fiat mir transformation, soundness and zero knowledge directly adapts from the underlying protocol. But now instead of uh, hashes, we have pairings, which is why this is not as efficient as the future mir transformation since pairings are expensive. Now the interesting questions are for which languages does this actually work and why would this be sound? And for soundness, the intuition is that since the challenge is hidden in a different group than the statement and the first flow, it should be difficult to um, use it in any way to, to cheat in the protocol. And um, this also limits what languages we can prove uh, statements about because um, inherently, if we want to exploit that the challenge and the language are in different groups, then of course our language can't span both pairing groups or even the target groups. So something like pairing product equations is quite unlikely. Um, and so the best we can currently do are algebraic languages, which only live over a single group. And uh, what can we do with this construction? We can uh, actually construct OR proofs, for example, for the DDH language, which, which is actually used in, uh, in many schemes. And um, currently um, the DDH proofs in many schemes are the gross high proofs, which require 10 group elements and 24 pairings, while we only need seven uh, group elements and 12 pairings. Of course, this comes at the cost of assuming our new assumption. And we also require witness sampleability for the languages. Uh, which I sadly don't have the time to, um, to define. For this, you'll have to uh, look at the paper or the longer version. Um, but also our proofs are also asymptotically um, shorter and faster than gross to high proofs. And some of the applications that I mentioned are, for example, tightly secure structure preserving signatures, simulation sound quasi-adaptive physics, uh, ring signatures, and many more. And since the uh, proofs are often a big part of these protocols, we can save uh, significant space and time with our construction. Additionally to the music arguments, as the title says, we also get statistical zaps for algebraic languages um, and using de-randomization techniques, uh, also uh, non-interactive witness indistinguishable proofs and also non-interactive zero knowledge proofs for algebraic languages under the standard DDH assumption, uh, but those don't improve over gross to high proofs. So they are uh, nice to have, but not as interesting. And if you want to read the full version, it's an ePrint and uh, you can also watch the long talk. And if you have any questions, I gladly answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, for the talk. Thank you for the talk. Um, let's see if there are some questions. So there's a question on Zulip. And Pratik Sarkar asks, uh, what is the cost of obtaining proof of knowledge? Um, Proof of knowledge um, is 
quite hard because uh, or is, is unlikely to, to get here because um, we basically talk about relations between exponents and not uh, between group elements. So um, proof of knowledge, we don't know how to achieve those with our framework. Uh, there's a follow-up on your question, as again by Pritik, uh, he asks whether you can use the knowledge of exponent assumptions to get it. Um, maybe, actually, we didn't really th um, think about that because our goal was explicitly to avoid strong uh, knowledge type assumptions and get everything under falsifiable assumptions in the standard model. So basically, if we would then uh, use knowledge of exponent assumptions and the like, we could use snarks and then uh, our construction itself would be kind of pointless because then we could get better efficiency as well, so. Thank you. Um, I believe we have a few more minutes. If, so if someone has more questions, please speak up. I don't see anything, so we can maybe move to the next speaker. Okay, so the next talk is titled Order Fairness for B. Ah, I believe Alon has lost his connection. Oh, so I thought I froze. Sorry. Okay, oh, so <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> then let me take over. Um, I'm back. Sorry. Okay, Alon, please. So, Julia, did you introduce already? Or, uh, no, I thought I froze it? myself. So I, ah. I, <laughs> okay, I'm back. I don't know. For some reason, it crashed. So, the next talk is titled Order Fairness for Byzantine Consensus, and the speaker is uh, Mahimna Kerna. It's a it's joint work with the Fan Zang, Stephen Goldfeder, and the Arjuls. So thank you for the introduction. Hi everyone, I'm a PhD student at Cornell and Cornell Tech, and today I'll be talking about order fairness for Byzantine consensus. And this is joint work with other authors at Cornell Tech. So briefly, the abstraction of state machine replication or Byzantine consensus can be used to build a linearly ordered log or a blockchain. And there's broadly two properties that consensus protocols need to satisfy. So the first is consistency, which ensures that all of the nodes have the same view of the linearly ordered log. And the second is liveness, which ensures that the system makes progress. So basically the linearly ordered log grows. But unfortunately, neither consistency nor liveness says anything about the actual ordering of transactions in the log. So for example, the consistency requirement can be met even if an adversarial node is able to choose the ordering for all of the transactions. And as it turns out, the transaction ordering is um, often very easy to manipulate in existing protocols. So this brings us to the central question that we sort of try to answer in our paper of like why exactly is fair ordering so important? So I'll briefly highlight two main motivations, but please see our paper for the full details. So the biggest motivator for order fairness is seen in the context of decentralized exchanges. And here results could actually be catastrophic without fair ordering. So there was this recent paper by Phil Diane and others at S&P 2020, which showed the rampant rise of bots on the Ethereum network which waited uh, to make profits from unsuspecting users by manipulating the transaction ordering. So this is not unlike high frequency trading on Wall Street, which was popularized by this bestseller expose Flash Boys. So this was a time when firms built low latency channels to the New York Stock Exchange and capitalized on information asymmetry to seal small profits at a really large volume of transactions. 
And blockchain exchanges aren't really as regulated as real world exchanges. So it's important to use cryptography to provably prevent order manipulation. So there's definitely a lot of practical motivation for order fairness, and I'm really only scratching the surface here. But we think there's a strong theoretical motivation as well. And I think for cryptographers, that's equally important. So order fairness, as it turns out, is a natural analog of the validity condition, a closely related problem of Byzantine agreement. So basically the validity property says that if all honest nodes are input the same value V, then all of the honest nodes should output the same value V. So analogously, order fairness intuitively is the property that if all honest nodes are input M1 before M2, then all honest nodes should agree to output M1 before M2. And again, this is not something that uh, current protocols satisfy. So we considered several definitions of order fairness in our paper, and it turns out some of the most natural ones are impossible to achieve. So here's the definition we settled on, which we call block order fairness. And this still maintains the sort of first in first style, first in first out style of ordering, but it is possible to achieve in practice. So here we allow nodes to deliver M1 and M2 in the same block. M1 just can't appear at a later index in the blockchain. So I'll, I'll also emphasize that we make minimal use of this relaxation. So our protocol will order M1 before M2, except when it can't due to an impossibility result. Uh, we also parameterize the definition using an order fairness parameter, gamma. So from a purely definitional standpoint, order fairness is strictly stronger than previously considered notions like censorship resistance or using a random leader election or using threshold encryption to hide the transaction contents before they're ordered. So finally, in our paper, we construct a uh, first fair ordering protocol, Iquitas, which we named after the Roman personification for fairness. So very roughly, the protocol will take place in three stages, the gossip stage, the agreement stage, and the finalization stage. And each of the transactions will go through these three stages before being output to the log. So in the gossip stage, each node will gossip its own local ordering of transactions as it's received from the clients. In the agreement stage, nodes will agree on whose uh, local orderings to use to sequence a particular transaction. And in the finalization stage, nodes will finalize the transaction ordering and output it to the blockchain. So the finalization stage requires no extra communication and uh, all of the computation can be done locally. So intuitively, this is because all the data that's needed to compute the final ordering is agreed upon in the previous two stages. In terms of adversarial corruption thresholds, our synchronous protocol requires n greater than 2f over 2 gamma minus 1. Um, so in the easiest case of gamma equals 1, we still require an honest majority. And our protocols also work for completely asynchronous models, but we require n greater than 4f over 2 gamma minus 1. Uh, another sort of interesting takeaway is our protocol technique actually serves as a general compiler that can take any standard consensus protocol and transform it into one that also provides order fairness. And this is because we only require weak broadcast and agreement primitives in a black box way, which can be realized from any existing consensus protocol. Um, so just some final thoughts. Our work is sort of the first to formalize order fairness and provide protocols to realize it. And we think order fairness as a primitive is important for a lot of blockchain applications. I mentioned decentralized exchanges briefly before, but we think um, in general, decentralized finance could benefit from fair ordering. And um, yeah, it, this could also be important for like initial coin offerings or ICOs for chance to do fair investing. So this concludes my presentation. I've put my Cornell email address as well as a link to the full paper if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maita. Uh, Julio? So let's see if there are some questions. If you have questions, please, you can either write in the chat or unmute yourself for those of you who are not here. And so let me start with one. Um, can you give some intuition about uh, why the uh, intuitive notion, notion of 
possible to achieve in general. You're muted there. Mike. Rose, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, yeah, I was asking whether you could give some uh, some intuition about what the uh, property, um, uh, the intuitive property of order fairness that you mentioned in the beginning is impossible to achieve in the general case. Okay, uh, so basically the it comes from a surprising connection to voting theory, um, specifically the Condorcet paradox. So even this basically is a situation where even if the individual preferences are transitive, that it, you can still have a case where there's a cycle in the ordering. So the global preference becomes non-transitive. Um, so this is why there's the, the impossibility result. But the key idea of why our block order fairness relaxation works is we can sort of shove these paradoxical orderings into the same block. I see, thank you. Any more questions, Julia? I don't see any other question. Um, neither here nor in the Zulip chat. So we okay, can give like so a few more seconds and then move on to yeah. the next talk. Yeah. Leo, you can start sharing. Yeah. If anybody has questions about previous talks, we'll, we might have some a few minutes at the end of the session. So feel free to ask if something uh, comes up. Okay, so the next paper is titled Generically Speeding Up Repeated Squaring is Equivalent to Factoring, uh, Sharp Thresholds for All Generic Ring Delayed Functions. It's a paper by Leo Rotem and Gil Segev, and uh, Leo will give uh, the talk. Okay, so uh, thank you, Alon. And uh, as Alon said, I'm Lior, and this is joint work with Gil. And this talk is going to be about uh, delay functions. So what are, oh, sorry, what are delay functions? So roughly speaking, a cryptographic delay function is a function which is efficiently computable, sorry, efficiently computable, but only in a manner which is inherently sequential. So concretely, a delay function takes in an additional delay parameter t. And given this delay parameter, the function should be computable in some time polynomial in T. So for example, 40 or T cube. However, it should not be possible to evaluate the function on a random input in time less than T. And this should hold even if we allow for a preprocessing stage and for attackers with the polynomial number of parallel processors. So one reason to care about delay functions is that they serve as a fundamental building block for two very useful cryptographic primitives. The first is time lock puzzles, introduced by Rives Chamir and Wagner in 96. And in our terminology, a time lock puzzle is a delay function which allows for a first generation of input output pairs, whereby first we typically mean in time polylogarithmic in the delay parameter t. The second notion is that of verifiable delay functions, or VDFs for short. These were uh, formalized a couple of years ago by Bonnet al. And in our terminology, a VDF is a delay function which allows for fast verification of input-output pairs, possibly given an additional short proof. Now, these two uh, primitives, time lock puzzles and VDFs, have numerous applications in cryptography. Uh, you can see a very partial list on the slide, but the main uh, takeaway message from this slide is that we want delay functions, which enable uh, extensions to time lock puzzles and to VDFs. Okay, so perhaps the simplest example of a delay function is the iterated hashing function. It's obtained by iteratively applying a hash function, uh, denoted by h in this case, uh, onto the input. And uh, then the output of the delay function is the output of the last invocation of h. Uh, one positive thing about this uh, function is that it has a formal security argument in an idealized model. So concretely, when the hash function h is modeled as a random oracle, uh, one can fairly easily uh, prove unconditionally that computing the function requires uh, T sequential calls to the random oracle. The downside of this function, however, is that it seems to lack the structure needed in order to enable extensions to time of puzzles and to VDFs. So what we want is a VDF, or sorry, delay function candidates uh, with more structure. And this is where the repeated squaring function comes into the picture. 
and it is defined with respect to some group G. And given the group element X as input, the output of the function is X raised to the power of 2 to the T. Now it's not hard to see that this is indeed computable in time T times poly lambda, where lambda is a security parameter by T repeated squarings in the group. And, and indeed, this function has uh, enough structure for time of puzzles and for VDFs. So it was first proposed by Rivers, Chamber, and Wagner as the basis for their time lock puzzle. And it was recently and elegantly augmented with succinct proofs in order to yield VDF candidates. So the sequentiality of this function uh, prior to our work was based on the assumption uh, that there are groups in which one cannot significantly speed up this computation uh, without preprocessing and parallel processors. So it's not hard to see that the necessary condition for this assumption to hold in some group is that this group is a group of unknown order, meaning that uh, it is infeasible to compute the group's order given the group's representation. And the main candidate that we currently have in cryptography for such groups uh, is the family of RSA groups. Uh, we do have a second candidate, which is the uh, class groups of imaginary quadratic fields, uh, but these are not as well studied cryptographically, and also the group operation there seems to be uh, somewhat less efficient. Uh, okay, so uh, prior to our work, this assumption was exactly this, an assumption, uh, and the repeated squaring function did not enjoy a similar uh, uh, formal proof of uh, security, not even in an idealized model, uh, as the iterated hashing function. So this uh, raises the natural question of, can we base the sequentiality of repeated squaring in RSA group on better established assumptions such as factoring or the RSA assumption? So in this slide, our contributions are the following. Uh, we present a sharp sequentiality threshold that applies uh, for all functions within the generic link model. Uh, so roughly speaking, uh, this model captures uh, functions and more generally, ge <coughs> sorry, more generally algorithms that uh, deal with ring elements, but without exploiting the underlying representation. And more concretely, what we do is uh, we put forth a new notion of sequentiality depth uh, for such functions. And we prove that this notion indeed serves as a sharp threshold uh, on the number of uh, sequential ring operations required in order to compute the function. So concretely, assuming the hardness of uh, factoring the RSA models in the standard model, uh, we show that the generic ring function of sequentiality depth D can be generically evaluated using these sequential rounds of ring operations, but cannot be generically evaluated on a random input with less than these sequential rounds of ring operations, even with preprocessing and a polynomial number of parallel processor. Now, I don't have the time to talk about this uh, notion of uh, sequentiality depth in depth, uh, but I will say that for simple enough polynomials, it roughly corresponds to the log of their degree. And in particular, for the repeated squaring function uh, with respect to a delay parameter t, uh, its sequentiality depth is exactly t. Uh, so as a, an immediate corollary, we get the generically speeding up uh, repeated squaring is equivalent to factoring. And I will mention that we also have analogous results for uh, pseudo-randomness, uh, but I won't have time to, to discuss uh, them. Okay, so I'll conclude very briefly with a couple of open problems. So prior to our work, uh, the landscape regarding the sequentiality of repeated squaring seemed uh, something like this. So on the one hand, there was no formal security argument, uh, but on the other hand, the assumption remained essentially unbroken for two and a half decades. And what we do is we somewhat uh, narrow this gap for a certain class of attacks, uh, namely for generic attacks. Uh, so obviously not all algorithms are generic, but this is a rather natural class. And two implications of this result is that uh, if you want to break the sequentiality assumption of repeated squaring, you now know better than to try and do it uh, generically. And on the other hand, it's a somewhat necessary step in the quest uh, for proving similar results in less restrictive models. So this is the first open question. Can you do so? Can you prove similar results in less restrictive models? Uh, and the natural candidate is the uh, algebraic ring model, uh, which is uh, a natural extension of the algebraic group model recently proposed by Fuchs, Bauer, Kiltz, and Loss. And the other open question is what about other candidate delay functions, such as uh, repeated squaring in class groups, uh, isogeny based constructions, or the recently proposed uh, uh, VDO function in prime fields? Okay, so that's all, uh, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Julia? So, yeah. 
uh, for those of you who disconnected uh, to ask questions, please unmute yourself or raise your hands or make your. Uh, if nobody wants to ask question, I actually have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, okay, so let me. Um, so, first of all, one clarification when you say that uh, you uh, assume uh, pre processing, uh, do you mean that? Um, does your result hold even if the adversary has access to the group description whenever it's pre-processing? No, so it holds, uh, the pre-processing algorithm is also generic. It doesn't right. have access to group uh, description, uh, but, or the ring description in this case, uh, but you know, it can do more than, uh, in the case of repeated querying, more than T sequential rounds of ring operations, uh, but it doesn't get the input. Right. I guess, I guess I guess my question was whether you can uh, query the group or, or even in the pre-processing. Yeah, you can query the, the ring operation oracle, you know, any number uh, of times that you want. Uh, but Thanks. obviously, you, yeah, you, you might get uh, access to some public parameters or whatever, but you don't get access to the uh, to the input function. Got it. Um, one more question is that some application of time lock puzzles, uh, I believe, to non-malleable non -malleable commitments, they require sub exponential security. Does your result say anything in that in that settings, where the attacker is allowed to run in sub exponential time? So, I'm I'm not sure what you mean about I mean specifically for. Um, so it depends how you measure time, right? I mean, uh, you have like two, two well, yeah, definitions I mean, of time in this model. Yeah, so, so you have like two definitions of time in this model. You have running time and you have the number of uh, uh, queries. So, you know, the online attacker can make, you know, up to, if the sequentiality depth of the function is D, up to D sequential uh, ring operation queries, and it can run in any arbitrary time T but then the factoring algorithm will inherit this time, right? So if you want to break the, uh, the, fa the factoring assumption, then you need to run in some, you know, in time, which is less than whatever you assume about factoring. Yeah, I guess my question was about the parameter D, whether you can set it to be, for example, sub, sub exponential or whether you are you're You can set it to be whatever. Got it, thanks. Yeah. So I believe there's no other question. Um, I guess we have a few minutes. So if someone has some questions about uh, the previous talks, please speak up now. You know what, I do want to say that uh, the um, factoring algorithm you know, will also inherit, the, the running time of the factoring algorithm will also be dependent on the parameter D. Right, so it can be sub-exponential if you believe some uh, some sub-exponential hardness of factoring, uh, but it cannot be too large, right? Of course, of course. That makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I guess uh, if you guys have any, any more questions, contact the speakers privately and uh, yeah, thanks Avon for, for sharing the session with me and thanks, I Julia. Give it back to you. Thanks everybody for participating and uh, for the wonderful talks.